Today, the problem with journeys that go nowhere. The problem with pitching our tent on a bridge. Welcome to Coffee with Creamer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Creamer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. Obviously, the journeys, the bridge, just just a metaphor, just a a, a way of representing a, a common set of problems, a common set of issues that I see emerge in people's lives and in institutions as well. Uh, but most of what I'll be talking about are, are us as individuals, uh, we as individuals, uh, starting off in a direction, interested in trying to resolve a problem curious about some discovery, some new thing that we need to take care of, uh, whatever it is, and then not ever arriving at it because we, on the journey, making it part of the way across the bridge, whether to reconciliation, discovery, uh, repair, whatever it is that we're needing to do, we just sort of lose our motivation to go the rest of the way. And it's predictable in some ways because the side of the bridge we're already on is what we're familiar with. And there is a certain amount of inherent risk or loss associated with crossing to the other side. And it may be too uncomfortable for us. And it's no, it's no greater, uh, you know, it's not like I'm inventing some brilliant idea. I mean, this is this is nothing not novel. It's what the, the Israelites faced when they left Egypt. Uh, it's what everyone faces when they're deciding whether to cross the Jordan and go in and conquer the land or to go to this new place to live. It is a, uh, it's a challenge to experience not just change, because getting on the bridge does represent some change, sometimes really significant change. But that's not the end. Uh, that's just part of the journey. And very often, we just look at ourselves and say, yeah, but I used to be over there on that bank. Look how much further along I am now. Now I live on a bridge. But we're not made to live on the bridge. I see the, I see the, the tents that are put up underneath the bridges on interstates and toll roads in our own community. And that's not where we're meant to, to stay. I understand a person needing to stay there. I don't even begrudge it. I get it when a person needs to stay there. But when that's their home, you know, something is not quite right. And we should do something better. And so it's, it's that as the metaphor for what I want to talk about. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, and these are metaphors themselves of the same thing. But they are examples of what I mean by getting part of the way there, but not necessarily arriving at the destination. So, for instance, uh, a friend of mine, in fact, my pastor, told me a story of riding uh, his bike around the lake. I ride my bike around the lake, so I could have experienced this as well, and I have seen things that were similar, but this one is just so on the nose, you know, it's just... Uh, so, anyway, he's riding his bike around the lake, so... I have to get that laughter out of my voice because this is funny, but I'm not trying to make fun of anyone. On the on a good side, I didn't see the person. So for me, I can just pretend it's a caricature of a person. It's not a human being that I'm talking about, okay? So this non-human being, who probably is a human being because I believe the stories my pastor tells me, uh, was riding their bike around the lake to exercise. It's obvious they're there to exercise. They are not in good shape for whatever reason that is, he was able to discern that this person was not in good shape. And so they were struggling along, but riding uh, this bike, which I find noble. Struggle along, exercise. Man, hallelujah. I don't think there's anything to do but praise when somebody's doing that. Pat on the back. Keep it going, you know. Did I tell you all this story? I'm going to pause and tell you a story. 
I, r- I was riding my bike around the lake one day. My, I got a flat tire. And I was on the far side of the lake, as far from my house as I could be. This was back when in Dallas, they had the rent-a-bikes that were out, you know. And so I got around halfway around the lake. I'm in a blowout. So no, no, there was no repairing the tire. And so I'm, I'm, you know, probably nine, eight, seven miles from my house. uh, And, and, and my wife's out of town. I have nobody to call. And so I'm just stuck on the far side of the lake. And in fact, Because of the time, I can't remember when it was, but because of the time, even my friends would have been busy. And so I just didn't have anybody I could call to give me a ride. And so here I am, and usually the only tool I carry with my bike is a cell phone, call somebody for help. But, you know, it's not unwalkable. I guess I said seven. It's probably five miles because the whole journey around is 11. And I was pretty close to the farthest point on the other side of the lake. And so I decided to, 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 to get back home by renting one of those bikes. So I downloaded the app, did it. I think it was a V-bike or something like that back then. And and there was one not far from me. So I walked over to it, did the rental thing, got on the bike. And so I had to find somewhere to hide my bike uh, so that it would be safe until I got back to it because I couldn't carry my bike and ride this other bike to get back. And five miles of long walk in bike shoes and in cycling clothes. So I just didn't want to do all that. So so I got one of these V-bikes, which is like a I don't know what you call it, a cruiser. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty relaxed bike. And here I am in my my bike cleats and my, you know, air-streamed, you know, bike clothes on one of these cruisers having rented a bike at the lake. I'm sure everybody's like, man, that guy overdid it for renting a bike. You know, that's not it. And so I get to the other side of the lake, and it's all uphill out of the lake basin to get to my neighborhood. And so I am, I am pedaling, I'm standing, I'm pushing to get the bike up the hill. And this car drives by and these people with nothing but good intention, they're like, keep going. You can do it. I know you can make it. They're like <laughs> encouraging me. It was the most embarrassing moment you can imagine. And I, I was just like, hey, thanks. Appreciate I didn't even want to talk to him. It's like, I hope these people don't know me and never see me again. Uh, so I get it. I, I don't want to humiliate anyone for being out riding a bike. Uh, there, this guy was out riding a bike, out of shape, and so hallelujah, out exercising. But at the same time, according to my pastor, he's out riding, this guy's out riding the bike, and every few hundred yards or so, he's stopping and chugging an energy drink. So one of these, the they have these little, these little containers that are just super energy drinks, you know, that you you chug in order to to maintain your strength. If you're riding a marathon, you know, if you're going, if you're gonna ride two or three or four hours in a row. And maybe every hour you need to stop and, 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 uh, you know, take some nutrients in it, especially the cyclists who make, you know, who make me look like, uh, they are, you know, streamlined themselves, their cheekbones, you know, are sticking out, uh, further than their handlebars. You know, they're just super streamlined people. I get it. If they're going for a two hour ride, they need to stop and eat something or their body's going to devour itself because they don't have any st- Bare energy. So they need those energy drinks. But you know, when you're carrying around an extra human being inside your own frame, you don't need to stop for an extra two or three or 400 calories every two or three or 400 yards. So I, I'm saying all of that. Not, and again, I, I don't, I never saw the person. If I had, I wouldn't even be saying this because we don't want to make fun of anybody. And somebody's out trying to exercise. Hallelujah. But you know, exercise isn't the end. Exercise is a means to being healthier, right? That's the object. And so if you commit to the exercise, but then don't actually use it to become healthier, then you might feel better about where you are, but you're not actually getting across to the other side where you have a different lifestyle and you're actually living in a healthier state than you were before. You get the idea. You don't want to go halfway. You don't want to say, I exercise, so I must be healthy. People who exercise have heart attacks while they're exercising. That that doesn't inherently make you healthier. And if the object of exercise, so I'll give you another example, and this one's more personal. I had a student come to me uh, almost two decades ago. I had a student come to me who was into bodybuilding. We had quite a few students who were into bodybuilding back then, which is a surprise. We're at Criswell College, right? But it happened. So anyway, this guy came to me and, you know, he was putting on some serious muscle and some, you know, he was, he was building, he was building his body. 
And he asked me about using steroids uh, because he was clearly doing it. And he said, you know, so what do you, what do you think about that? And I said, well, you know, I mean, if the point of exercise is to be healthier and you know that using steroids in the way you're talking about creates some health problems, even though it gives you an advantage in the competitions you're in, I think maybe you ought to reconsider whether to use that kind of a, a product or not. He wasn't using it illegally. That would be a different thing altogether. This wasn't illegal. But it was, uh, you know, not healthy. And I don't know what he ended up doing, but that's this is my point. And, and I will say this. I, in my view, the destination should be about health. This is the nature of what exercise is designed for. And, it, and, and for, for this guy, for instance, I think he would have said, well, you know, it's not all about health. It's about these competitions, and it's about my appearance. And I, if I can obtain that, then, you know, what's the harm? Well, I... I so I think there's something self-contradictory in that, and I don't mean philosophically, and I'm not trying to say morally he was a complete failure. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I mean the nature of that kind of competition, the appearance, let's say that appearance is the goal instead of actual health. It, shouldn't that indicate the same thing? I mean, when we're looking at a person who we consider attractive, Shouldn't it be because there's something innate in us that says, oh, that person is extremely healthy. Wow, wish I could be like that. I, I think there's something about a, the wholeness of being human that's supposed to be in the way we respond to each other. And I don't, I don't mean sexually or anything weird. I just mean in the fact that you say, oh, that's, that's, that looks right, and I want to be like that. There should be something healthy about that because we're supposed to pursue life, not death, and so on. So that's not super complicated. And I think because of that, because of the way we can confuse appearance and exercise or health, appearance and health, we can also confuse the means for, not only the means, we, first of all, we can lose a sense of where we're trying to arrive, but then we can certainly become confused about the means of getting there. That's why I think we have some of the queasiness we do, maybe you don't, but I do, about some of the more glaring examples of, you know, cosmetic surgery that's gone sort of awry. Uh, and, and, and I don't mean just a botched job, but you know what I mean. I mean, when somebody's had enough cosmetic surgery that you say, wow, that, that doesn't actually look quite right, you know? And I don't mean just natural. I get it that there are, a lot, there are a lot of things about us that are not natural. We're cutting our hair. That's not natural, but whatever. But I, but I do mean that there's something that looks off. You know, it looks askew about it. And it's not just the failed attempt at making the, the appearance better. I think what it is is sometimes a jarring reminder. Like, you know, two things have been juxtaposed that you don't want juxtaposed. So a jarring reminder that the pronounced destination and then the actual point of arrival were not the same uh, because what we were trying to arrive at was youth or what we were trying to arrive at was health and vigor and look how energetic I am. But what we were actually trying to arrive at was just a, a feigned appearance of that. And if they're not the same and, and may have been determinately different to begin with, then something's gone wrong, right? And in that case, what we end up with is people who've camped out on the bridge. Well, I'm going to exercise but not get healthy, or I'm going to make the appearance of being healthy but not actually take care of my body and not ever arrive at what we're supposed to be doing, which is, you know, pursuing. And I, look, I'll put it in a what I find to be a sort of a trivial way, uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's in the virtue ethics model. Uh, to arrive at something virtuous, where we're actually stronger, better, holistic human beings than we were otherwise. It seems like that is the kind of thing that we ought to be pursuing. So, you know, not getting caught on the bridge. You understand the example I'm trying to give. Those, that's just an example. Another example, and these are just simple examples of sort of self-improvement, you know, th considering self-improvement as the journey. Get across the bridge. Be a better person. You know, that kind of idea. Another example would be counseling. So, and just think of the journey this way. You know, on, on this side of the bank, we realize something's askew. Something's wrong in my life. I, 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 need, I need to do something different. I, we're, we're just not happy with ourselves. So we get on the bridge. We talk to a friend. We get some, you know, hey, I, something's going on. I need, I need some input. We, we read a book. You know, we actually go to a store or, you know, get online 
download it or whatever you do to read your books. And we, and we read a book, self, a self-help book, right? So here's, how, here, here's the lifestyle of people who don't do that dumb thing that you're doing. Uh, and you read that book. And so you're going to, oh, this will that, that'll be great. We get advice. But at some point, we might realize none of that was enough. So I've gone to an expert and I've asked them and I've gone to, you know, a bookstore and read the book. I've gone to my friends. I've talked to them and I'm still, still something's not right. You know, I I need to deal with this. And so we find a therapist, we find a counselor, somebody we can sit down with and we, and, and we know it's going to cost us some money, but we're going to do it. You know, I've got insurance. I'm going to take advantage of it, whatever. And so we make a visit and then we quit. Well, I talked to the counselor, you know, and I got their input. So now I think I understand what's going on. Maybe you do more than that. Maybe you go to the counselor and you go a bunch of times, which is fine. It doesn't matter. I mean, I know people who go to a counselor all the time. But instead of actually changing, instead of actually addressing the thing that needs to change in you, you use the counselor, and this happens to us sometimes, you use the counselor to sort of, you incorporate that counselor into your unchanged normality. Well, I'm, I'm still doing exactly the same thing I was doing. I'm still experiencing the same frustration, but now I've got somebody to talk to it about every week. And, and that's an improvement. I'm not saying that's not some improvement. At least you're on the bridge, right? But, you know, eventually, and I saw this. I saw this happen when our church, when I was pastoring, I, we had, we didn't have him on retainer, but we used him regularly and we would pay him. We had a professional counselor that we would have come. If, uh, if, if after talking with somebody, I realized they needed way more than just pastoral counseling, you know? And so we did that. And I've mentioned this on here before. We had a, a teenager one time uh, who had some serious uh, issues going on. And, and once I saw that, it's like, oh, yeah, this is, this is way outside of my league uh, as, as your pastor. And so I want to I wanna bring in this professional counselor. So we brought in a professional counselor. And for a long time, uh, this teenager visited with that counselor and I would just be there uh, in the evenings and doing other stuff and see them come, see them go, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and I remember uh, a night of sort of transformation in that teenager's life when they burst out of the counseling room and found a quiet corner and just wept. Uh, they just needed to be alone and weep. Uh, and that, you know, I would descri- uh, describe, and I, and I wasn't in the sessions and I, I don't have any idea what was going on. But, you know, I would put it this way, that it does seem to me that a lot of times there needs to be that moment when you, if if you're really going to get to the other side and stop living on the bridge, you have to climb through, to change the metaphor here, Shawshank's sewer, right, in a hard session, in confrontations, in order to come out on the other side of the ditch, on the other side of the wall, and not be in that prison anymore, which is itself this, you know, really brilliant cinematic image for those who've seen that movie, you know, whether you've seen it or not, or read the book uh, from Stephen King. It's a really brilliant image of that, you know, coming out in this new and different life. That, getting to the other side of the bridge, is what counseling is for. You know, let's see you emerge on the other side. Now, I'm not saying that's the only thing it's for. I'm not saying that can be the only end result. I I don't mean that at all. But I mean, in a lot of cases, going halfway and then quitting when it gets uncomfortable is the assurance that you're never going to get to the other side because that moment when you finally decide you can leave that bank behind and you are committed to crossing over the bridge to the other side, that is often the point that you're trying to arrive at. And staying on the bridge, I'm not saying it's not an improvement. It is an improvement, but it's it's not where we ought to end. It's not where we ought to be satisfied. And so, you know, in, in, in both of those examples, getting to the other side of the bridge would be experiencing a real change in yourself. And that's my point for today, at least to get us to the point of understanding that many of the things that we're confronting, many of the things that we're seeing are not quite right. We only think of in terms of everything else that needs to change for it to be right. And that'll take us all the way out onto the bridge. Oh, you guys, you know, you need to be different. Uh, you, the world needs to change here. The circumstance, situation, job, whatever needs to change. But we just stop there. And if it does change, okay. And if it doesn't change, okay. But we never get to the other side of what we were supposed to get to, what we were supposed to be provoked toward because of that discomfort that we had. And again, one of my favorite passages, and I've talked about this uh, on this uh, in this podcast before, uh, not on this episode, obviously, but I am now. 
One of my favorite passages is Matthew 7. Once you realize what it says, the power of those statements, judge not that you be not judged. And why do you, you know, see the speck that's in your brother's eye, not notice the log that's in your own eye? You know, reading all of that only as don't judge other people is important. I mean, it's important to grasp that. Obviously, that's an important point. But that's not the point of the text. The point of the text is you've got serious things wrong with you. That's what he's saying to me. I'm not saying it to you. God is saying it to each person who's reading the passage. We have serious things wrong with us, and we need to get those out of our eyes to think that we read this passage and then use it primarily as a justification to say, well, you know, once I've fixed the stuff in me, I can finally get back to fixing everybody else. That's a comp- You're completely glossing over the point of the passage, which is stop trying to fix everyone else and start seeing the things in you that need to be different. Hence, verse 5, you hypocrite, Jesus can't say anything much stronger in critical terms about us than to call us hypocrites. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. Then you'll be able to see clearly to take not a log out of your brother's eye and see he's still emphasizing your brother wasn't the thing that needed to be fixed. You were the thing that needed to be fixed. You got a log in your eye. You get the log out of your eye, you know, fine. Go over and help him get the speck out of his eye. But then you're going to realize he wasn't the problem to begin with. You were. So get the log out of your eye. It's 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 just a fantastic passage. And so it ends in verse 6, this section of it ends in verse 6 with, don't give to the dogs what is holy. Don't throw your pearls before the pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn again to attack you. So here we are. What we do that we're not supposed to do, what we do is we're lobbing judgments. We're lobbing what we think of as righteousness, holiness, at people on the other side of the gorge. And all it's doing is the opposite of what we're actually commanded to do. We're creating division. We create this elite opinion of ourselves. Look, we are righteous. Be more like us. Put this this mud that we're throwing on you. Put it on you. It'll make you more like us. It's just absurd. So we're creating division, this elite opinion about ourselves, a derogatory opinion of others, and doing exactly the opposite of what Christ did. When he, I mean, just in every, as close to literal as it can be, crossed the bridge, right? I get it. It's still a metaphor because he descended from the heavens, but he crossed the bridge to come and be us and not just a little bit of the bridge all the way down to death and not just any death, but death on the cross. You hear the echoes of Philippians 2, right? So you get the idea. So using the examples of self-improvement, those are just examples. I want uh, to have a conversation with you about how we see things that do need to be addressed, things that need to change. But instead of getting all the way to the change, instead of getting all the way to the other side of the bridge, we stop halfway as if to say, this bridge exists only so you can change, only so that can change, not so I will actually be drawn into being something better, something different than myself. Because somehow or another, in spite of our total rejection of the idea of second blessings or final sanctification in this life, and if you don't know this, those terms, it's fine, but we, ju- we reject the idea that we become perfect while we're in this world, despite, and I mean by us, mostly Baptists, but a lot of evangelicals hold this same view. You're never going to be perfect in this life, not perfect until you see Christ face-to-face, and that comes in heaven. And despite all that theological rumble, we think we're good enough. I'm good enough. Something in the world is wrong. It can't be me. It's got to be everybody else that needs to change. And so we think that we see things that are wrong. We're willing to climb out on the bridge. Ooh, really take a risk, you know, get halfway out on the bridge and expose ourselves to the people we think, oh, they're so corrupt. They really need to change and never realize that it might be an invitation for us to open our eyes while we're on the bridge and go, Oh, oh, that side is not just rabble and disgust. There's something over there that I've been missing, and I may be the problem. Maybe the Lord wants me to change, and so we need to cross over the rest of the bridge. I can think of 
all kinds of examples where we've done this, where we've, where we've seen this happen. And, you know, I'm going to choose one that's a little risky. I mean, sometimes, you know, our, our culture is so conflictual over this right now uh, that just bringing it up can alienate people. I hope it won't. I hope you'll be willing to cross over the rest of the bridge with me, right? So, but, you know, to see the problem, just as an example, in our culture, and I'm not giving, I'm not really going into depth yet. I'm just still trying to lay the groundwork for the conversation. That's pretty much the whole thing today. To see the problem, so in the culture, when we're looking in the culture, to see the problem with some effort that's being made in the culture, to see the problem with some set of solutions that these people are offering and that they they want to enact or, you know, or something, but not to see through to the problem that still exists that that solution was attempting to address, even if you still disagree with whatever the proposed solution was, is what I mean by us getting stuck on the bridge. So I've given examples of this in the past. In previous episodes, uh, we did one on, uh, on, uh, on feminism and, and abortion. And we talked about how not seeing the, the complete issue would make us say, oh, those feminists, those radical feminists, they just want this and that, and never actually address the fact that there, there are inequalities that need to be addressed in the relationships between men and women in our society. And it's not super hard to figure that out. But because we only see our opposition to certain solutions that are presented, we never look through that to see the extant problems that still need to be addressed. And that were, by the way, addressed by those proposed solutions only because we weren't proposing anything. We were just sitting on our hands about it. I've done whole episodes on that. I'm not going to go back and, and rehash all of that right now. But on abortion, it's the same thing. Why would people be pro-choice? And it's for and it's for reasons that if we're not willing to go and look at, if we're not willing to cross over the bridge and realize that we're not just dealing with a set of monsters on the other side, but with human beings who had concerns about things that, that we can actually have legitimate concerns about without even changing our mind on the issue of abortion. If we don't ever recognize that, then we're just choosing to camp on the bridge instead of actually arrive at a destination that we should have arrived at, a peacemaking destination, for instance. Again, you know, the other example, and the one that's, that's, that I was mentioning that seems so offensive in our culture right now, but for heaven's sake, we, we still have to talk about it. And the fact that it's offensive shouldn't keep us from being able to have open discussions about it. Racism, especially in the way we regard black families and communities in America, is a perfect model of getting on the bridge. We're definitely on the bridge, but not crossing the bridge, not necessarily going all the way across. You know, so where we start with slavery, other side of the bank, something's wrong. Everybody knows something's wrong. Got to get rid of that. And so we come to finally abolition. It becomes illegal. No slaves. We're not going to allow that to happen and so on. And then what we do is, you know, we, 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 tre- we, we, with trepidation, we put a toe on the bridge. Okay, we, we've abolished slavery, so we'll, we'll, we'll fine. But, but we're going to establish some, some guidelines here because, you know, uh, a, a slave isn't going to know how to live in a free society. And that's the language that was used, not mine. I don't agree. But this is the language that was used. Well, they're not going to know how to be free. So what are we going to? So we established the Jim Crow South. And I say we, I just mean our culture, our society established the Jim Crow South. And then we finally said, no, nope, you know, this is not good enough. We need to get further out of the bridge. We got to do more than that. And so we make it illegal. We say, you know, this kind of institutionalized, and what we really mean by that is legislated, formal segregation is not going to be allowed anymore. Uh, Obviously, there is a remnant of informal segregation that's very real. And by remnant, I don't mean a slight, uh, you know, just a piece of cloth floating around. I don't mean that. I mean residual. I mean, there is still, obviously, a huge amount of informal segregation, which is, and and if you say, oh, why would you say it's obvious? And that's ridiculous. Just look at where people live in the city of Dallas. It's obviously a segregated city. It doesn't mean that anybody's put up a barrier and said, you are not allowed by law to live in a different part of the city. It doesn't mean that. That's the whole point of calling it informal. Not trying to have this stop arguing with me and I'll move forward, okay? So I get it. I'm being defensive about it. But I'm just making the point that there's a lot of informal segregation that still exists. And uh, and so, so what we do is we say, all right, let's eliminate those 
informal barriers, which, by the way, for a long time were actually formal barriers, redlining, and uh, you know the and, and and you know the pretense that there was an economic requirement when in reality it was a cultural requirement or an ethnic requirement. Uh, those kinds of barriers we look we look at, and I think most uh, most people in our society say, "Oh, we got to open that door." We need to erase those red lines. Uh, we need to get rid. We need to create new opportunities and greater opportunities, and we need to figure out how to do that in a sustainable way. I think people are for that. I think most people are all for integrating into. So here's the problem, and, and so I'm going to introduce the problem. So we're out on this bridge, and and it's a miles long bridge. This one, because we we've left slavery behind. It's, I'm putting that in air quotes, and are going to make things better. And so now we've got a society where not only is slavery abolished, but Jim Crow segregation is illegal. And we're at least making an effort to open the doors and create opportunities to integrate society so that there's no, there's no residual inherent barrier in someone's life because of their ethnicity. This is, this is what we attempt to do. And so people would say they're all for integrating into society Integrating, so and especially I want to talk about African Americans, people who have uh, a descent that is in some way attached to the slaveholding history of the United States. So we say, oh, we're all for integrating society. Uh, but what we mean by that is integrating into society in the way that we have experienced it as a majority culture. So, of course, you can come to our shop. Of course, you can live in our neighborhoods. And all you have to do is follow our rules. All you have to do is fit into the way we've structured society. After all, that's the society we live in, right? But all the while, come on in. Absolutely. More than welcome. All the while, turning little side glances and winks at each other about music, fashion, holidays, politics, food, anything that seems eccentric to the cleavers you know, toward Cleaver and his family. It's just like, ah, you know, what? they're not quite there yet, are they? We just, it's a, it's still, there's a residual problem. We still have an issue. And again, if you just have just frank and honest, open conversations with people, you discover that there is some residual racism there. It doesn't mean that everybody hates everybody or that slavery has returned, but there is a, a problem that still needs to be addressed. And and we, and, and by that I mean a white majority, we don't always ask ourselves why. You know, we, we, don't always ask, we, don't, we don't always say to ourselves, is there a reason that there is a difference in the music or the fashion or the holidays or the politics or even the food or the other behaviors that make people seem eccentric to us? When in reality, for instance, we don't ask ourselves why there might be a higher priority on community identity in a lot of black churches, for instance, than there is in a lot of white churches. You can say, I don't think there should be white churches and black churches. You can say that, but there are white churches and there are black churches. And if you, if you don't know that, you're just not looking at churches, honestly. And, and, if the, and, if there, and there are differences between them. And one of the differences is a much stronger sense of communal identity in some black churches, not all, but in some black churches. Just, I mean, look, I've talked to pastors. I've talked to congregants in the churches. There is a stronger sense of identity sometimes. And in some African-American neighborhoods or communities, there's a stronger sense of that identity with that community. Why would that be? And very often we're saying on one side, well, you know, why can't, why can't people just let go of the past? You know, we'll say this. It's been 160 years since slavery was abolished. Let it go, man. Let it go. But, but in, so, in saying things like that, we're just not making the journey all the way across. And by the way, I don't presume that, uh, that some, some, uh, some African-American guy has to think about slavery or has to you know, have an opinion about it one way or the other. I, I don't have any say in that whatsoever. I can only speak to my community and the people who are around me and say, if we're, if we're going to make the journey all the way across— then it seems like we should be willing to reconsider our blanket statements about how some group of people ought to let go of their opinion about a, an ethical crisis of unimaginable proportions. The slave trade, 
I can't emphasize enough how unbelievably consequential that ethical violation, moral violation, human violation was. And I hope that in, say, 100 years, a little less than that, 90 years from now, so that it's 160 years from the event, I hope that we're never saying to any Jewish community somewhere, man, can't you just let the Holocaust go? I mean, that was 160 years ago. Come on. Because I hope they remember it. Because I hope we remember it. And I hope it helps us do better in the future. And if that's a part of the identity of a people group, then of course there's always going to be a distinction between those who are in that group and those who are not in that group. And if we're ever really going to deal honestly, even just get closer to the other side of the racial divides that still permeate American society, then we've got to be willing to lean a little closer to that end of the bridge where we say, I I understand why our cultural identity may always be a little distinct. And that's not an inherent problem. I can cross over the bridge and begin to understand where other people come from when I stop pretending they have to be just like me for me to understand them. So you get the idea. I'm saying in the culture, and that's just an example. I was using feminism and abortion and racism just as examples to say, If we get out on the bridge, that is an improvement. Can I at least see that there are people I don't want to just make my enemies and create a permanent barrier between me and them, but I want to build a bridge to connect, to to be able to do something, to, to become a peacemaker. Getting on the bridge is not enough. Getting on the bridge is going to be the first time I have a serious invitation to walk all the way across the bridge to stand for a moment in my brother's shoes, to stand for a moment in my sister's shoes and to experience what she experiences, to understand what she's gone through, to get where she is right now. That is a much more difficult commitment to make. That is what I mean by climbing through Shawshank's sewer. That's what I mean by getting to the other side of the bridge. It's also true about spiritual things, and this is where I would really start making the application for the conversation I want us to have, and obviously this would be in two parts. I know there's an irony in there, having a whole episode about not getting to your destination and then not getting to my point. I get it. I get it. I'm laughing. (laughs) You're so funny. Okay, so anyway, so the spiritual side of this, let me give an example in the spiritual world. Just religion in general. So here's here's another example where, where we can start where we are, You know, our life is empty. We're trying to find purpose in life. We know we need something, right? And so we realize we we want to add to the to the emptiness of of a life without the depth and meaning that religion could add to it. And yes, I know I'm talking about religion and not Christianity right now. Not I'm not being specific. I'm just talking about religion in general, spirituality in general. We know we need something, and so human beings come to that point. I need something in my life beyond just eating and waking and sleeping, you know, and reproducing. I need something more. And so we want the stability, uh, the self-reflection and self-discipline, the beauty, the depth and complexity and, and meaning that comes when you experience the religious aspect of life, the part of life that says there is something more to this life than just eating and drinking and reproducing and dying. There's just something more to us than being purely biological. There's something spiritual in our existence. But then what we do is we're we're like, oh, well, good. So so I'll add some stability and self-reflection, self-discipline, some beauty, some depth to my life. But for crying out loud, don't go overboard, you know? You know, you don't want you, you don't want to mess everything up. And so you don't want to become a zealot. You don't don't need to become an evangelist for whatever that thing is you found. I mean, I'm glad you found something, but leave us alone, right? We don't want to step outside the cultural norms because what we were really looking for was something we could tack on to the life we already had. We want to stay on this side, 
but were willing to venture out onto this bridge a little ways and just see how deep the chasm might be. <gasps> Ooh, that's pretty. Yeah, oh, I might put a tent out here and live out here and just maintain the religion that allows me to keep my normality where it was to begin with, but with a little more meaning than it had before, right? Fine. So don't go overboard. Just add a little to your cultural norms. Fine. Give a little to the poor. But don't, 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 don't go overboard. Don't do too much. You know, my producer is Daisy, and Daisy taught a series at our church recently on Wednesday nights on, on money, on, on learning to give away, you know, to live for the things that you're here for eternally, you know, not for the things that are temporary, and to rethink your relationship with money. I'm not going to recharacterize your whole thing, believe me. So she's, I'm sure, over there getting nervous. Is he even going to get it right? He doesn't even know what I really taught about. But the, the, but the point is, is pretty, pretty straightforward. Using the example of Christians throughout history, there's a point at which we're supposed to rethink our relationship with material objects. And so where we would say, oh, well, it's fine. You know, they got religion, and so they give, you know, a dollar or two to the poor every week, or, or they maybe, maybe they go what some people think is a little crazy and give 10% of their money away on a regular basis. But, you know, it's still, I mean, you keep it 90%, so it's not too radical. I mean, I can still at least respect you in the business world or something like that. But don't go insane on me. Don't go, don't go making any kind of commitment where you'd give enough stuff away that it actually affects your lifestyle. If it actually affects the way you live, then you may have gone too far across the bridge. This is how we treat religion. We come to it, and we want to use it, and we want to get the things from it that help us to add meaning to our lives, but we don't want to give up where our life was to begin with. You hear how similar that is to the counseling thing that I was talking about too, right? There is a point at which God does confront us and I think religion in general confronts us. And this is not unique to Christianity. It's in, it's in religion. It's built into it where it does make demands on your life that require you to do something different. It's the thing that I've referred to before, and this is not invented by me or created by me, but as extraordinary religion, uh, using the language of sociologists. So uh, it is something that's outside of the ordinary. So that, you know, you, you do have to cross a bridge to get over there. And again, I'm not saying everybody has to become John the Baptist, but I am saying something fundamental changes in Nicodemus's life when his religion becomes something more than just camping on the bridge, right? Yeah, I'll visit with the good master for a little bit and just figure out what's going on. And Jesus says, no, you're going to have to crawl back in and start all over again, be born again, start over again. I can't, I mean, how would I do that? Crawl back in my mother's womb? What am I going to do? Nicodemus's response is the evidence of how dramatic the confrontation from Jesus is about what it would mean to cross over the bridge to the other side. And that's, that's what I want us to get to. And I want to talk about it in terms of, you know, straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel and all the things that go with the relationships that we have, with how we deal with family and friends and strangers, and even the way we interpret things. And I mean by that, how we interpret lyrics that we hear in songs or movies that we see and whether we're willing actually to cross over and be ourselves improved and changed by the things that we experience. And again, I'm, I'm here to acknowledge the irony in the fact that I'm doing an episode about never making it to our destination, and yet we're going to put down stakes right here and camp on the bridge toward our destination. But we'll take up and start heading across again next time. So I'll see you then. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Creamer. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. <laughs> Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at berrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.